the devil is in the deception business. And there are lots of lies that he wants you to believe. And at least for his top of the pops, lie number one, the research shows us that he's being extremely successful. But what if you knew what those lies were and you were able to hit them out of the park? Hi, welcome again to Christianity Works. As we kick off a brand new series of messages called The Top 10 Lies That the Devil Wants You to Believe. Now look, I don't know whether you actually believe in the existence of the devil or not. The statistics are pretty clear. Um, the Barna Research Group in the USA is a very well-respected research group and they've done the numbers. What they found is that around 78% of people in America believe in the existence of an all-powerful, all-loving God. That's what, almost 80%. And almost exactly the same number disbelieve in the existence of the devil, or a few of them aren't quite sure. When you think about it, that, that's kind of crazy. 80%, or 78% actually, but 80% believe in the existence of God and almost the same number, 77%, disbelieve in the existence of the devil. What about you? Do you believe that there is a, a personal force of evil in this universe or not? Do you believe there's a personal force of evil in this world or not? The moment I say to people, I believe in the existence of the devil, well, you can see their faces. They think, hang on, is is Bernie a bit loopy? Is Bernie gone crazy? Is he a bit you know, religious and, and superstitious? I mean, we used to believe in the existence of the devil maybe way back in the dark ages, you know, when people were into myths and all that sort of stuff. But come on, this is the 21st century. Surely nobody believes in the existence of the devil. You want to know why I believe in the existence of the devil? Because Jesus clearly believes in the existence of the devil. Back in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says this, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life in all its abundance. The Bible talks a lot about the existence of a personal force of evil. Now, you can say, well, look, that's really just an allegory. That, that really doesn't exist anymore. But let me tell you, Lie number one, the, the lie that the devil most wants you to believe is this, that he doesn't exist at all. If we believe that he doesn't exist, then he can sit there quietly in the bushes like a sniper taking pot shots at our lives without us really noticing. I've called this series the top 10 lies that the devil wants you to believe. And I really want to tackle this first one right now that the devil doesn't exist at all. You know, the devil appears really early on in the piece in the Bible. Come with me, please, to Genesis chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Firstly, did you notice that the devil doesn't appear as some black figure with horns and a pitchfork? He appears rather innocuously as a serpent, as a, as a snake. He camouflages himself, he, he hides himself. 
And then he propagates a lie. Did God say that you couldn't eat of any tree in the garden? Well, of course God didn't say that to Adam and Eve. Otherwise, they would have starved. And Eve picked him up on this lie. She said, no, no, that's not what God said. God said that we shouldn't eat of this one tree in the garden. Remember back when I was in the military, the art of warfare is all about deception. I mean, you think about it, soldiers, when they're out in the field, they wear camouflage gear. They wear camouflage cream. Why do they do that? So that the enemy won't see them. I used to be an officer in the Australian Army. And they taught us the art of deception. You constantly wanted your enemy to believe something that was false. You might hide so that he didn't know that you were there. You might build a false installation so he thought you were over there, but not you might make your force seem much bigger than it actually was or much smaller than it actually was, depending on how you wanted to deceive your enemy. It's exactly what Satan does. Satan is the father of lies. And he begins here by hiding himself from Adam and Eve so that he could twist the truth. Come on, do you believe in the existence of of the devil or not. I remember just recently in the, in the block of apartments, the units where I live, uh, there was someone who was breaking into the car park. There are about 150 units in this particular place where I live. And someone was breaking into the car park and stealing from people's storage units and from their cars. When they eventually caught the man, I saw some of the security photos of him. And you know, he looked just like anyone else. He didn't look like a criminal. He didn't look like a drug addict. He was well-dressed. For all I knew, had I seen him in the car park, he was just one of my neighbours living in this, this block of 150 apartments. Thieves don't hang out a sign and say, here I am, it's me, I'm here to steal. They hide themselves in plain sight. And it's exactly what the devil does. Now, how, how does that happen in this day and age? Well, let's just take a few examples. The devil is really keen to see society shift away from the morality that God tells us is right. You see this whole fluidity on sexuality these days in society that even 20 years ago would have been unthinkable. It's all about equal rights. It's all about having people be able to be in same-sex relationships or change their gender or all of those sorts of things. And, and when a Christian stands up and says, no, excuse me, that's not what God says. This is the truth. This is the word of God. Society wants to shoot them down. Who's behind all of that? Is it just happening? No. Satan is very happy to see those changes going on, and he hides himself in them in plain sight. It's the same with the economy. Governments encourage their people to spend up big because consumer spending fundamentally drives economic growth in most places. They don't encourage them to save. They don't encourage them to be frugal. They don't encourage them to give to the poor. No, spend up big so that we can have constant economic growth. Until what? Until we run out of resources on the planet. So Satan is hiding in the systems and the attitudes of this world. And he's tugging away at you and me to go and conform, to go and be part of that, to forsake the truth of God's word. It's exactly what's going on. 2 Corinthians 11.14 says this, And no wonder, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Don't be deceived. Satan is alive and well in this world. C.S. Lewis put it this way. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. Don't be that materialist. Don't be duped into thinking that the devil doesn't exist. Because if you do, he will sit there in the bushes like a sniper and take pot shots at you. Believe it or not, the devil is real. 
The second thing, the second lie that the, the devil wants you to believe is that you aren't who God says you are. Have you ever been plagued by self-doubt? You, you compare yourself with other people and, and you find yourself coming up wanting, falling short all the time. Low self-esteem is, is a plague in the society. It's an epidemic. Almost 50% of all women suffer chronically from low self-esteem. And then there's this sense, well, I, uh, you know, I, I'm not good enough for God. I, he would never bless me. I, I'm just a normal person. And I've made so many mistakes in my life. You know the way the thinking goes. Do you find yourself in that place from time to time, doubting that there isn't, even is a heaven, doubting that, that God would let you into that heaven, even though you kind of believe in this, in this Jesus who, who died for you, whom God sent to this earth to pay for your sins. If Satan can get you to believe that you aren't who God says you are, then he is going to ruin your life. Firstly, if you don't believe he exists. And secondly, if he can undermine your thinking, your faith, he'll blow you over. See, Satan rarely comes with a full frontal attack. Much easier to chip away at the foundations of your faith, little bit by little bit. Because you know what happens if you chip away at the foundations, if the foundations become weak, all of a sudden the whole structure will fall over. One of the big, biggest issues in society today is people not knowing who they are. We just get up every morning and we live life and we go to work or we do whatever it is that you do every day and we don't think too much about it. And yet almost by osmosis, we take on what the world says about us. We take on what other people say about us, the criticism, the backbiting, the belittling. We watch the ads on television who say, this is what a beautiful person should look like. And, and we compare ourselves to that and we say, well, you know, I'm just not that person. This is Satan plaguing you, trying to undermine your faith so that eventually your faith in God, in Jesus Christ, will topple and fall over. But in order to counter that, you and I need to know the truth. You and I need to know who God says we are. Because if God says something about us, then it's true. When God speaks, things happen. So we're going to take a short break. And after that break, we're going to open God's word to see what he has to say about who you are. I just want to take a moment to remind you that there are so many free resources available here on the Christianity Works website. The free life application booklet, uh, the Media Lounge. Hey, the Media Lounge is a great asset for you. You can find thousands of messages of life-relevant Bible teaching. And if you click on the advanced search feature, you'll be able to zoom in on exactly the teaching that you need for today. So check it out. That's all here at the Christianity Works website. So the second lie that the devil wants you to believe is that you aren't who God says you are. The problem with this is that God's wisdom and the world's so-called wisdom are so diametrically opposed. And most Christians don't even read their Bible, so they don't know truly what God's wisdom is all about. It's so easy for us to get sucked into what the world tells us. You know those old... Um, mirrors that you used to find in Sideshow Alley at the fairs and you go and stand in front of them and you've got all these distorted images of who you were, tall and skinny and short and fat and all wobbly. That's what happens when we get our self-image from, from what the world says about us rather than from what God says about us. Come with me please to the Bible. We're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 beginning at verse 25. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were noble of birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, 
to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. I love that, because so often we look at ourselves in the mirror and we think, we're not good enough. I mean, I'm not like that super spiritual person over there. I'm not strong. I don't have this huge faith. God could never choose me. I'm not clever. And yet what God's wisdom is saying here, which is so counter to the world's wisdom, because the world's wisdom is about looking good and performing and delivering and being wealthy. You know, if, if you look good and you deliver and you're wealthy, you're successful, you're worthy. And if you're not those things, then you're not worthy. But God's wisdom right here is saying this, that God takes those who are the least and exalts them and does something with their lives. God takes common people, ordinary people, not superstars, ordinary people like you and me into his kingdom as his children, into his family. That's the truth. Do you see how opposite, how diametrically opposed God's love and God's truth is to the so-called wisdom of this world? Let's turn to Romans chapter 8 and see exactly what God says about who you are. Romans chapter 8 verses 12 to 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we are dead as not according to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God, children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified. See what God's saying? You believe in Jesus. It's not about living the way the world lives. It's not about living through our flesh, through our carnal desires. It's about following the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit witnesses to us that if we believe in Jesus, we are children of God. God says about you that you are his child. Are you perfect? No. Are you a superstar? Perhaps not. That doesn't matter to God. He, he loves you more than words can possibly ever say. That's the truth. But the devil is shouting at you through the world systems through the advertising industry, through the people who criticize you, through your self-comparisons. The devil is shouting at you that you're not worthy, that you can't possibly be a child of the living God. And that's why it's so important for you today to receive this truth. Let's flick over. We're going now to Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Then what are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can possibly be against us? Down to verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in our Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, that is the truth. And I believe God wants you to receive that truth today. Nothing, nothing can separate you from the amazing love that God has for you. Believe the truth. Know who you are in Christ Jesus. You are a child of the living God and a co-heir with Christ and nothing can ever take that away from you. The third lie that I want to talk about today is this. The devil wants to whisper in your ear, Ah, you've really blown it this time. And there's no way back. And the power of that lie is that it's half true. And half truths are always lies. Have you blown it? Have you made mistakes? Have you sinned against God? Absolutely you have, as have I. The Bible says we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The problem is that that's only half true. The second part, where the devil says, well, there's no way back. 
God is never going to forgive you now. Simply isn't true. I want to share with you an email that I received from a person who was listening to one of the radio programs that I produced a little while back. I won't introduce it. Just have a listen to what he says. I'm only a new Christian and I've been with the Lord probably about 10 weeks and I've been going great guns. And then I had a night when I, I went out drinking and I told my friend I wasn't sure if, it, if I could be a Christian anymore. I felt really terrible about it. And I thought I'd really blown the whole thing with God. It's only when you came on the radio tonight that I realized that's why Jesus died for me. Thank God for his grace. It was really awesome tonight. Of course it was really awesome. Because what that man heard on the radio that night was the truth. And the truth is that Jesus died for every sin, past, present, and future. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter what just happened last night. You are forgiven if you go to God in faith through Jesus Christ. If, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, if, if that's what's in your heart, then you can go to God and be forgiven. Can we be pleased to Romans chapter 5? It says, therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope. And hope doesn't disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. For while we were weak, just at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we've been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. Do you get it? This is about grace. The grace in which you now stand, the grace in which I now stand, by definition, is something we don't deserve. If we deserved it, it would be a right. As it is, we don't. And therefore it's grace, the undeserved favour of God. And Jesus died to purchase that grace for you. You may be suffering. You may be going through bad times. The devil may be whispering into your ear, see, you see, you've blown it. There's no way back. But God sent me to you today to share this truth with you. There is always a way back. The price that God paid for your sin on the cross is so great. The death of his eternal son that it far outweighs the complete sum of all the sins that you will ever commit in your life. If you've been Staying away from God because you're afraid, because you don't think there's a way back. My friend, today the good news is that Jesus died to give you a way back. Why don't, why don't I just pray for you right now? Father, I pray for that one person who is struggling today. I pray for that one person who is just believing this lie of the devil that there's no way back. Lord, through your truth, set them free. Thank you that you sent Jesus Christ, your son, to die for each one of us on that cross, to pay for our sins. And thank you, Lord, that Jesus rose again to give us a new life, an eternal life. Holy Spirit, please take your word today and write it on our hearts and set us free from the lies that the devil is throwing at us to try and ruin our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Don't forget, the devil only comes to steal, kill and destroy. But Jesus came that you may have life in all its abundance. May you be blessed, greatly blessed, as you receive the word of God into your heart today. Well, that's pretty much all that we have time for today. If you'd like to watch this message again, don't forget you can do that 
at our website, ChristianityWorks.com. You'll see it right there on the homepage this week on television. These lies are insidious. And, and when you get the word of God in your heart, you're going to smash the lies of the devil right out of the ballpark. So come along to the website and check out that message. Watch it again and let the truth of God permeate into your heart. Now, when you're at the website, don't forget that you can also get instant access to the free Christianity Works daily devotional. It's called Fresh. Words of inspiration, hope and encouragement delivered right to your inbox each and every day. It's free. I'd love for you to receive Fresh. So you can subscribe right now at our website and may the word of God turn your life completely upside down. I'm Bernie Diamond. You've been watching Christianity Works and I'll catch you again same time next week with another message of God's love, God's grace and God's power for each one of us in Jesus Christ.